Hi everyone, I'm Dan Hayes. Um, the goal of my lecture is to at least provide some fun, some entertainment, some clinical take-home pearls. Um, just to add on to the last, um, the last one with the epinephrine, don't be scared of epi. Epi really is the treatment for anaphylaxis. Um, it was mentioned sub-Q. Epi works great, I am. But if you have somebody who's extremely large, morbidly obese, um, I hate to say it kind of like my mom, you want as long of a needle as you can. Um, the EpiPens just aren't long enough to get IM, and it won't really do anything if it's in adipose compared to muscle. Uh, first thing I wanted to start off with is this x-ray. A couple of people have seen this, but what's going on with this person? And there's actually a point behind it. Feel free to point stuff out. I'll point up and no, we'll bring up the next one, which makes it really obvious. So she's got a pacer pad on, and she's got a little bit of a wide mediastinum. Um, there's some clips from her bra. Um, but if we look at the next one, she doesn't really have a head attached. So we go back here, there's no head. And the whole point of this is when you're looking at your patient, look at the whole picture. We're really focused on landmarks. We look at certain things. And I walk up to this, and everyone's going, what the hell's wrong with her? And I'm like, where's her head? Next one, everyone's like, oh shit. <laughs> so it's just really one of those things before you look at your landmarks, look at the whole patient. Otherwise, you're going to miss a lot of things. So, first up, let's talk about some different local agents Emla versus Elamax. Uh, Emla is a mixture, it's got pyrocaine, lidocaine, Elamax is just straight up lidocaine. Big difference with Emla is that you can have pyrocaine in it, you can get patients with methemoglobinemia. I always stick to Elamax over Emla just for that reason. They work great on closed skin, uh, needle sticks if you have the time to wait for it. They work good for bug bites, they work good for sunburn. Just don't put them on open skin. Um, I've made that mistake before, I was getting tattooed and I had some with me and I was like, oh, this seems like a great idea. And the emulsion that it's in, it caused it to burn like no tomorrow. So you'll actually cause some more harm than good with your patients. Um, lidocaine, we know max is 4 mg per keg unless we're using it with epi, and we go up to 7 mg per keg. If you have somebody who's allergic to lidocaine, it can be one of a couple things. So we can have an amide allergy. If we have an amide allergy, we can safely use an ester, so tetracaine. The next and more common allergy that I hear is people say, oh, I went to the dentist, they gave me something that felt funny. More than likely, it's a fact from the epi, not so much lidocaine. So you can always ask them about that. One of the others is preservative. So it's interesting that everywhere I've seen here in New York, we use the uh, multi-dose preservative vials of lidocaine. Um, PABAs are the preservative in lidocaine. Something like 20 to 25 percent of the population is allergic to the preservative that we use in lidocaine. So you can always ask, and if you're concerned, I'll use preservative free. If you have a patient who's truly allergic to amides and you don't want to try an ester, we had a patient the other night with this. Uh, you can safely use Benadryl as a local anesthetic. If you use Benadryl, it's 1 ml of the 50 mg per ml Benadryl, add 4 ml of saline to it, and you have a local anesthetic that's equal effective to lidocaine. Um, buffered lidocaine, I get asked a lot about this. Uh, lidocaine has a relatively low pH, it's around 3. Um, adults, you can say, suck it up, it's going to sting, it's going to burn, and they're going to be numb. I always try and keep, treat kids with kid gloves. So if you have a pediatric patient and you're concerned about the, the acidic effect and the burn, you can always buffer your lidocaine. It's 9 ml of lidocaine with or without epi, 1 or 2 percent, it doesn't matter. And then just add 1 ml of sodium bicarb. That will bring the pH up to neutral. You don't get any of the burn with your injection. Just please make sure you don't do it the other way around. There's a case report where they used 9 ml of bicarb, 1 ml of lidocaine, and the person wound up with an alkaline burn. Switching gears a little bit, antiemetics and opioids. How many times do we write an order for morphine and zofrine on top of it? Well, the patient's going to get nauseous. If you give someone an opioid, you have about a 3, three to 4 percent incidence of nausea vomiting. You add an antiemetic to that, you have a 3 to 4 percent incidence of nausea vomiting. <laughs> Giving antiemetics does not make a difference. It may make your nurse happy thinking, oh, I'm going to do it in advance, but it's really not going to do anything to the outcome. In the old days, it used to be promethazine and morphine. The nice thing was you'd give it to your patient, they would go to sleep. But it can cloud your disposition, it can result in admission, and again, it's really no benefit to the patient. Okay, so the American way, more must be better. How many times have we given four is and the patient's still vomiting, so let's give them another four. 
you look at the literature, there's no difference giving stat doses for non-chemo-induced nausea and vomiting. So I had chemo yesterday, I showed up today, I'm puking, my gut's up, absolutely, go big guns. Um, but if you give a dose of four, it doesn't work, let's switch to a different agent. You'll get synergy using different agents. Um, in Rochester, we did a study, we looked at one, four, and eight, and we found no difference between one and eight milligrams. And the only reason we didn't publish was we were too short of reaching power. And a resident graduated and we couldn't get anyone to pick it up because it took two years to get 98 patients. But in the surgical literature, they've evaluated 148, no difference. And in the ER, we've looked at it as well and no difference. So ketamine, great drug. Um, it's interesting, I haven't seen that much of it used in New York. In Arizona, all combative agitated patients have four makes per gigabyte in ketamine. Um, ketamine we can do any way we want, whether it be IM, IV, or oral. Um, I had a brilliant kid in Rochester whose dad was a vet, and he was stealing it from his dad, dipping cigarettes in it, and smoking it. Um, so people can, it can go in any way you want. <laughs> um, one other great thing with ketamine, I joke around if I was trapped on a desert island and could have one drug, it would be one of the few I'd have with me, um, is a low dose for pain. Um, so we have a lot of opioid use here in New York. You get that trauma patient with an open fracture who's screaming, you can pour opioids on them, it's not going to work. Low dose ketamine is amazing. 0 0.1 to 0 0.3 mg per kilo works like a charm. <coughs> Just to stress, when you do use ketamine, try and use their ideal body weight, not their actual. So again, you get somebody who's, who's enormous and you use actual weight, you will snow them, even if you do the 0.1 to 0.3 per kilo. That's IV. IV, correct. If you do IM, I usually do 0.5 per kilo. Um, ketamine can increase secretions. If you're doing IM ketamine, I'll usually advocate for a small dose of an anticholinergic, whether it be glycoperolate or atropine, and that's going to help drive some of those secretions and prevent with it. People ask when we're doing ketamine Lutheran for sedations, well, how about adding a, some Versed to it to prevent emergence? It's been shown it doesn't prevent it. It's just going to prolong their length of stay. So if they start to come out of there um, after the procedure and they do start to have emergence, you can do a small dose of midazolam after, but there's no benefit to giving it up front. The whole intracranial pressure and ketamine's kind of been debunked. I just try and recommend not to use it for people who have glaucoma or eye injuries because it actually can bump your intraocular pressure. So, so this guy was using a stable saw. He forgot to tighten on the safety. Wood went through, hit the safety, and the safety bucked out through his forehead and into his left eye. <coughs> Probably not a good idea for procedure in him. Uh, Ketofol, great combination if you're using it for a painful procedure. Um, I don't know, chest two, uh, somebody who's got multiple open fractures and we need to redo some. Um, I always just make sure to do it the right way. The original studies were done where we mixed the two in the same syringe. The problem is with the different pharmacokinetics, you have different onsets of time. And your ketamine will work, um, it takes a couple minutes, and then your propofol has to catch up. So if you're using ketamine and propofol for procedure, get your ketamine first. Wait a minute or two. Wait for them to start to dissociate. Then push your propofol afterwards. If you do them both at the same time, you almost wind up chasing your tail to get the procedure done. So what's a better <coughs> way? Um, this is something I've seen relatively new here at Luther, and I thought I was safe from this until recently. Um, the whole idea is that when we have our chronic alcoholics, that they're not getting their nutrition, and we need to replace their multivitamin, other nutrients, etc. For the most part, it's kind of bunk. If they drink beer, if they drink wine, they're getting their thiamine, their folate, their mag, their multivitamin. <laughs> If you have somebody who is a hard drinker, they're drinking hard liquor, nothing else, you probably will need to replace their thiamine and folate. The multivitamin is questionable. Banana bags are expensive. People wind up ordering them. The patient winds up carrying out their VE, leaving AMA, it winds up getting tossed in the trash. So it's a great way to make some pretty colors, but it's a decent way not to do much for the patient. Um, I would say if their gut works, use it. So a lot of times we'll just replace things orally. Um, and I will really only recommend it for the chronic alcoholic that we know is, again, hitting hard liquor and not much else. <coughs> the question winds up being magnesium and do we prophylactically treat them with mag or not? So you've got a hardcore drinker, they're not eating, all they're doing is boozing. Alcohol is a diuretic, they're not getting intake of mag. More than likely they're going to be hypomagnesemic as well. So I usually recommend checking that and then suppleting, uh, supplementing as well. 
So opioid intoxication. Bad. About 10 years ago, it was about 200,000 visits nationally. That's doubled, if not quadrupled. Um, in 2016, New York State alone, we had almost 50,000 patients to the ER for opioid intoxication. So opioid withdrawal, I say it's worse, more so for us than the patient, because if we reverse them too hard, we're stuck with them screaming, we're stuck with them yelling, and we can't really do much for them. Um, what else do I want to say with uh, Narcan? Um, we can give it really any way we want, whether it be IV, IM, sub-Q. Uh, we can do it into tracheal if we can't get a line, which we don't really do anymore. We can give it nasally. A lot of people use nasal, nasal atomizers. Uh, one of the things that I like to do is um, nebulize Narcan. Um, if you look at the Australian literature, it's almost the way to go there. It's kind of gentle. It's kind of easy on them. Um, as long as your patient's breathing, they can breathe five, six times a minute. Think of our lungs having a surface area of about three football fields. So as long as they're getting some in, it's going to start to reverse. And when they start to withdraw, they're going to pull the mask away. So it's almost self-limiting. And we don't really set them into acute withdrawal. The other nice thing with nebulized Narcan is you don't have them sit up <coughs> screaming, taking a swing at you. Uh, you don't have them soiling themselves, whether it be from top to bottom. Um, I always talk about what should our dose of Narcan be in the acute withdrawal. So um, I'll pick up Brian because I know him and say uh, my faculty member here takes lots of opioids for back pain and he forgets and he double dips and shows it completely snowed. If we give him two full milligrams, he's going to sit up, he's going to puke, and he's going to take a swing at people. So the best dose for them is to start low, go slow, titrate up. If you have somebody who's overdosed on a sustained release and we start at point one, it doesn't do anything, try another point one and up, it works. They're breathing, they're setting, they might not be completely awake, but we're where they want them. Consider starting a continuous infusion at the dose, at, I'm sorry, at the rate that gave you the best effect. So point one didn't work, point two is this term started at point two an hour. The bolus will get you to where you want to be, the drip will keep you where you're at. How do you make your um, nebulized Narcan? Um, so I'll take the two milligram and put it in a neb cup and just have them breathe it. Okay. You don't um, dilute it at all, you just put the two milligrams in and they were... Correct. And they're the two different forms. There's the two per two and the 0.4 per one. Um, it's a tomato tomato issue, whichever one you have handy. <clears throat> okay, so next little pearl, super glue to the eye. Um, <laughs> Unfortunately, I have seen this. I have my little minion saying that you're crazy. Um, I might be crazy, but you're stupid. Medicine doesn't fix that. Um, I had a couple of more interesting x-rays I was going to put in here, but for the cleanliness of this talk, I took them out. Um, I've actually seen this a few times where people aren't very bright. And they keep their eye ointment and their super glue in the same thing or in their purse for some reason. It makes no sense to me, but it's something that you actually may see throughout your career. Um, so it's interesting, superglue cyanoacrylate, if you look at Dermabond, it's two octal cyanoacrylate, so it's one molecule different, making it from a 50 cents item to a $150 item. Um, so if you're ever out and about and you get yourself a glueable laceration, use crazy glue, it's the same thing. Um, it does set quickly, it's often less than a minute. Um, that bond is waterproof and it's usually in a couple hours. Um, so the sooner they present, the better. Um, for skin, warm, soapy water, um, you can consider acetone that may break the bond. Um, if it's their mouth, um, if their lips gently try and roll it apart, don't yank because you're just going to tear skin. Um, if they actually get it in their mouth, more than likely it's going to solidify immediately and just have them spit it out. Um, in the mouth isn't necessarily a big deal. But in the eye, it's actually going to attach to the eye protein and it can dissociate from it over a couple hours. So the treatment for it is a 3% bicarb solution. Um, and I've got the recipe in here, so for the slides being filmed, you can look at it at a later point in time. But it's actually, it, it does work. And I'm not going to go through this. I'll leave it up here for a second so the camera can, that can get it. Um, but we all use Morgan lenses for eye decom. Um, if any of you have had a Morgan lens in, it's painful, it's uncomfortable, it's kind of miserable. For someone like this who's got crazy glue in the eye, another alternate way to decom the eye is using nasal cannula for oxygen. You can spike a bag, um, take the tubing to that, and connect it to the nasal cannula. You put the cannula on the bridge of the nose like I have my resident do to me for the picture, um, and it's just going to irrigate the eye. It's going to flush through and it's going to be a lot more comfortable for the patient. 
Um, just going back to the side, I've got tetracaine here. I'm sure we all know this. Never send your patient home with tetracaine. Um, not so much from anesthetic toxicity, but to prevent themselves from being stupid. Um, we rub our eye, it hurts. That's our protection against rubbing our eye. We put tetracaine in, it's numb. We continue to rub. We rub, we rub until we have damage. And unfortunately, I've seen that too. Okay, so um, next up is minimizing um, uh, pain with propofol. How many times have we given propofol and the patient goes, oh my god, it burns? Well, again, adults, we can say, suck it up, deal with it. I'll talk a little bit more about it. Um, this was Christmas Eve. He got a brand new pocket knife. He broke the golden rule. Instead of cutting away from himself, he cut towards himself, and he slipped. So, what, is, what do I often hear? Dan, can you mix some lidocaine and propofol and uh, help prevent some of this? What do I hear? Can you change the con standard concentration? Uh, let's make an error. <laughs> so... <laughs> Looking at it, propofol hurts. If you look at the ED literature, about 20% of patients experience some form of pain. If you look at the anesthesia literature, it's almost 70%. So they've looked at some of the different ways to prevent pain. One is we can reduce the rate. You push it slowly, you're never going to get that big bang. You're never going to get them to sleep. Um, they looked at adjusting temperature. Um, they've looked at pre-bed. They've looked at filtration. I'll go through some of them. Um, temperature propofol, if we lower it, it still hurts. If we do it room temperature, again, it doesn't work. Um, if we increase the carrier rate, it doesn't work. Um, they've looked at topical nitro, which I'll talk about for something else in a minute. Uh, we talked about topical lidocaine a little bit. If you um, emla them or LMAX them, you're going to wait an hour for that to work, so you'll just be wasting time. So what does work? Well, a decent dose of fentanyl. Well, we're hopefully we're giving them some pain meds anyway for their procedure. Let's not give them more. We could consider some diphenhydramine, but that's just going to snow, well, possibly snow them. I know if I got 25 of Benadryl, I'd be out for 12 hours. Uh, we could consider some regulating with or without a tourniquet. Again, this is all from the anesthesia literature. What really works is how about some lidocaine before the propofol? So again, you've got that kid who you really don't want to make them uncomfortable. Put a tourniquet on, put one to two cc's of one percent lidocaine, let it sit for a minute, take the tourniquet off, and chase it with the propofol. They won't feel a thing if you're really concerned about it. The number needed to treat in this study was two patients. If you do it without the tourniquet, it's four, but again, let's go smaller for better. If you mix it with propofol, we're looking at the same as doing it without a tourniquet, so let's not mix it. So, the dilemma for us. More steps, more time, more errors, we don't want them. We want them out the door. If we mix it, we're going to change concentration, which leads to errors. If we premedicate them, it could cause discomfort, we could cause side effects. We had a rash with one of our PAs in giving Ritalin, and eight of our ten patients had dystonic reactions. So the last thing you want is to give someone Ritalin, run the risk of them getting dystonic while you're trying to do a procedure. And the majority of the evidence is in, in the anesthesia literature where all they use is hand veins. So again, what really works, make sure you have a decent line. That's going to minimize a lot of your discomfort. If you can't get a decent line, um, consider doing lidocaine with a tourniquet. And again, for kids, I've seen it work miracles. <clears throat> Next up, is it going to fall off? It's a great title for this one. How many people have seen an EpiPen accident? It happens. People aren't very bright. If you look at the history of it, 87 was when the EpiPen first introduced December. We had the first case report in July of 1989. And I laugh about this because one of my colleagues who's in the same position by at Mayo in Minnesota was giving a demonstration on the EpiPen and accidentally went off in her thumb. So, I mean, it happens to even some of the most, the most seasoned professionals. So concern, we know that Epi is an alpha-1 agonist. We're going to decrease blood flow. We could run the risk for ischemia. How often does it happen? Um, I thought this was interesting. Almost 20% of physicians self-inject during the training session. And 100% of them read instructions. So it happens. So what can we do? We can watch and wait. We can do warm water. Uh, we could do a couple other things. So watch and wait. In 2013, there were 213 patients from Poison Center data. It was all watch and wait. All had complete resolution. None required surgery. Nitro ointment. Um, there's some success in the literature. It's minimal. The ones when I've done it, it's been a fingertip. It's been really blanched. You put paste on, you put a glove on, you let them sit for a while and just reevaluate. Um, they can get some headache. They can get some hypotension. Again, if it's just a if it's a finger digit, you probably won't see hypotension with it. 
You can try fentolamine if it's available. It keeps going on and off back order. The problem with fentolamine is it's really painful. So they've had an ouchie. We're now, <coughs> at, we're now adding insult to injury. Um, and again, it's rarely available. It's been on back order to the best of my knowledge for the past couple of years. So more than likely, it's not going to fall off, thank goodness. Um, if you do need treatment, again, nitro paste, it's cheap, it's readily available, and it works. Um, if you can't get it or you do want to try fentolamine, tell your patients it's up that you hurt yourself, but this is going to feel even worse. Mm -hmm. Okay, got a couple minutes left. So last one, mace or pepper, pe oh, yeah, a question. I had really good luck with just hot packs. And, and you can try warming it too. Um, but some people, you know, cold work clamp down, you warm, and hopefully you'll be able to dilate. Um, this was interesting. In Tucson, we had a prison riot. Um, everybody got sprayed with mace. We had something like 100 prisoners come in. And they're like, what can we do to quickly decon them? So most pepper sprays are mace has capsation. Um, capsation is going to essentially cause substance P to be released. It's going to cause burning. It's going to cause irritation. It's going to cause pain. Um, real quick, a great new thing that we've discovered for capsation use is hyperemesis um, from pot smoking. So if you have somebody who smoked way too much pot presents an hyperemesis, we know that a warm shower is the best thing for them. But if you're like Lutheran that has a cold shower, get capsation, rub it on their abdomen. For some reason, it works wonders. So, <laughs> um, hopping back to treatment options for our mace exposure, we could consider irrigation, we could consider milk, uh, we could consider a less uh, potent acid, we can consider local anesthetics. So, Sorry. I killed it. I'm sorry, I'm technologically adept. Well, while we're on the topic of hyperemesis, what do you think of applying uh, for hyperemesis? If they're, if they're tacky and hypertensive, it's reasonable. Um, again, they're vomiting, so now you have to get it in them and have them keep it down too. Um, besides the um, besides the capsation, I will generally hit them really hard with antiemetics. Zofran, whether it be Haldol, whether it be Compassine, and Reglan on top of it. Okay, so advantages to topical acids, it's cheap, it's available, it's safe, and it doesn't really work. There's a paper out there that looked at it, and this was compared to saline. Um, pain score from zero to five, saline was actually worse than antacids. And so our prison exposure, we were essentially pouring bottles of Maalox on people. We were in snow off, we sent them right back to jail. And it worked <coughs> really well. So essentially the mechanism of that action that we've determined is it's increasing the pH and it's going to decrease the receptor sensitivity to the capsation. Okay. I had 50 slides in a half an hour. Any other fun drug questions? Uh, the Maalox, can you put it in the person's eyes? So eyes will do tetracaine drops and then just Maalox to the exposed skin. Okay. The mixture for um, the local anesthetic diet. Mm -hmm. It's one ml of Benadryl and add four mls of saline. So it's a one percent solution. Do you have any tricks for patients coming in asking for methadone? So, unfortunately, that's a very tricky issue. Um, one of the things for people who are opioid seeking, I'll recommend uh, prescribers for Lodine for them. Um, Lodine is a total act. It's one of the next generation NSAIDs. People hear Eam, they think codeine, they think morphine, they think they're getting something. They go to the pharmacy, they go to get it filled, they find out A, it's not an opioid, B, it's really expensive, and they usually don't come back and bother you again. 